Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you all are alive and awake and well. I'm so glad that you are here worshiping with us this morning. I am Judy Red Platt. It's my privilege to be one of the pastors here. And we are continuing our sermon series on the lights that light our way from Psalm 119. And so today we are going to be talking about love, about obedience, and that obedience is love. <laughs> and that love is obedience. Will you pray with me? Holy, gracious, and life-giving God, Lord, we need your word to be a lamp for our feet, to light the path before us, to show us the way of revival, renewal in our lives. Holy God, we pray that through the gift of your Holy Spirit this day, that the praise songs that we sing, the prayers that we offer, the scripture that is read, and the word that is proclaimed will penetrate our hearts and our minds and transform each one of us to be more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it is in his precious name we pray. And together we say, Amen. Good morning. I'm going to tell you what you need to know. 
and also what you'll want to do, I hope. Jamie Alexander, I'm privileged to be one of the pastors here. I'm going to welcome everyone to worship this morning. We pray that this will be a day of great blessing for you. If you would take time to sign in for us, we'd appreciate it if you sign in on the attendance pads. That helps us keep up with, um, with you and, and persons. When sometimes it makes it hard to do that because everybody's so moving around and got so much going on in their lives. I want to refer to the announcements, and so I'm not going to talk about everything on the, on, in the bulletin, so I trust that you'll read it, and you'll, you'll see the shepherd groups that are meeting and committees that are meeting and, and your own areas of interest and opportunities to be involved in mission and ministry. But I'm going to tell you a few things. One is, last night, um, Becker Hall was full of youth and children that served dinner to persons that came, and we had a great time. And um, because your, your chairs are straight, because Mark, Engel, and because of his beautiful wife here, and me, we made sure with some youth that you had a place to sit. And um, so we want you to know that we had some meals left over. And those meals are provided for you today. They're $5. You see all about them on, on the um, screens, what's offered. There's a chicken parmesan, and then there's brownies, and then there's cobblers. And, that's all available. There's also, are there rolls left? And there's rolls too that are available for five. There's two pans of rolls left too. So, no, there's two rolls. I, okay, just go with whatever they got over there. And, um, and, the, and the money goes towards the youth. And so we appreciate that. Only the berry cobbler's left. Okay, that's what I'd say. Other people bought it, and they didn't get it. So, um, but also you have opportunity. I'm going to show you the next slide. And that is to bid on something that was created for last night. Austin Curtis is youth director here, and he created this power graphic thing, Burning In. And he did that. Actually, he did that for his wife, Amber, for Valentine's Day. And then he stole it from her, and he brought it up here to put on on um, display for bid and it's actually out in the hallway where you sign up for midweek manna it's there and you can see it so we invite you to make bids for that and that money goes towards the youth as well this wednesday we will have um, the second session of this semester of midweek manna and we will want to encourage you to come and to be a part of it we had a great time last week we had such a great crowd and, and we ran out of food but the miracle workers in the kitchen produce new and food and so if you're able to sign up with us it would be of great help so that we we can make sure that everyone has enough food that would really help us you can sign up online you can call the office um, look on the website you know you can send smoke signals you can do whatever it works and and we will we will get those and there are different classes you can see on the screens that are offered you can see those on the back of your bulletin this week in the Bella Vista my hometown class there's going to be a program presented on the various animals in Bella Vista. So we want you to know that. And I'm sure that's a great interest to so many of you. And also, in the class Living Single with Confidence, it's a two-parter. This week and next week, it's all on, on tips, um, technology tips and simple home repair tips. And so we invite you to come and be a part of that. But also, there's the Bible, the mini-series takes place, and you're invited see the Bible come alive through, through a movie, and that is taking place in the sanctuary. Or if you want to learn more about United Methodism, dism, ism, ism, I guess it's Methodism, in it, right? Or Methodism. But anyway, you're invited to come to that class, and that's, that class is using the book Revival by Adam Hamilton. And you know what? There's a video, too, for you that are just like me. You need more visual learning. You, have, you get to take a trip to England, and it didn't cost you anything but the price of the book. And you'll see all the places where John Wesley was. And so we invite you to be a part of that. And there was a woman's Bible study. All that is listed for you. There's some activity groups of crafts and creative coloring and those types of things as well. And the youth meet and the children meet and everybody meets. And so everybody has a good time. So... Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about is, if you will select door number two, we have Carol Merrill here in Pack-A-Sack. And we're going to talk about Pack-A-Sack. Pack-A-Sack is something I'm sure you've heard about, but maybe you have not really clued in. And that is the third Sunday of every month. You have opportunity to bring your, your 
non-perishable items to here. And, and this is Carol Merrill, but, or, or Sue Niebrig. <laughs> and, I mean, look at the good things that come. We've got coffee, cookies, all kinds of stovetop stuffing, pasta. This month's food will be given to Restoration Village and um, there. You want to say something else? Well, a Restoration Village... <laughs> Restoration Village is a Christian-based home for women and children in crisis. They receive no federal funds, and they depend on the generosity of the people in Benton and Washington County to keep their doors open. Any type of pantry food that you want to bring, it's always wanted and needed. The only thing we ask is that you check the best by date. We cannot give out food that is out of date. And I know there's a lot of people that have been concerned and confused. We've got so many packs. We had Pack Shack last week. That was something that we did. We also have Snack Pack for the backpack. That's <laughs> for Cooper School. But this is simply Pack a Sack. And so just bring pantry food the third Sunday of each month. And if you want to be reminded, we have a few of these back there. It's a little... Uh, you can put it on your refrigerator and it reminds you when to bring your pack -a sack stuff. So thank y'all and just remember the people in Benton County, all of our stuff goes to Benton County to nonprofit organizations and they all need our help. Thank you. See, and in my limited knowledge, I can't remember pack shack, pack backpacks, pack a sack. So I just bring fruit or crackers or peanut butter that goes for all those things and I'm covered and maybe that's a suggestion for you as well. Well, we're glad that you're here. We welcome those that are worshiping with us by live stream. We pray that God's, God's power and God's presence will stir your hearts and, and that you'll be led and to worship. We're excited that you're here. We welcome you. At this time, our praise team invites you to worship with us this morning. Uh, you may stand or stay seated, just be in a posture of worship as we sing, You Make Me Brave. I stand before
good. And all the time. Let us share God's love with one another and greet each other in the name of Christ. Make sure everyone is made to feel welcome. Can we have the children come down? Do we have all the children? Children, children, big children, little children, children of any size and age. Hi, guys. How are you? Hi. Hi. You guys are brothers, aren't you? Yes. Tell me your name. Pierce. Pierce and, and Nathan. I have a Na Ethan. Ethan. I have a Nathan, but not an Ethan. That's an awesome names. Hi guys, you all, I think I know all of you, so we're glad you're here. I have a question for you. What's this? It's a heart, but it's, all right, yes, it's interesting. Hi, sweetheart, come up here, have a seat. Can you make room for him to sit between you? Right there, yeah, good, thank you. Well done, well done. Well, the, I'll tell you, the, the boy said, this is a heart. The girl said, this is a Valentine's card. <laughs> so keep that in mind, all you male figures out there. So this is a Valentine's card. Tell me about Valentine's. What do we do with Valentine's? Give them to people. How do we decide what people we give it to? Who, who do you sometimes give Valentine's cards to? Your friends? Good, good. Do you sometimes give them to your parents? 
Okay, all right. So your friends and your parents and grandmas sometimes, and sometimes grandmas give you Valentine's cards too. So lots of times it's people who are friends and in our family, and we just want to, when we send these, what are we meaning? What does this this mean typically? We're losing one. Oh, dear. (laughs) It usually means I love you, doesn't it? To say I love you to your friends and your parents and whatnot. Well, um, you know, uh, there are all kinds of love. And Jesus said to us, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, did Jesus mean send them a Valentine card? No. No. So what did Jesus mean by that, love your neighbor as yourself? Yeah, tell me. You bet. Treat your neighbor like you would want them to treat you. Exactly. Very well done. Now, who's, yay, yay. who's your neighbor? Ooh, that's a hard part. What did Jesus mean, your neighbor? Did he mean the person who lives next door? Not just that. I see a shaking head. Maybe the person next door, but more than that. Jesus meant that all of God's children are our neighbors, and we should treat them, other folks, just like we want to be treated. Suppose you're on the playground. Most of you are in elementary school, I think, or close to it, um, except for this little guy over here. If you're on the playground and somebody falls and gets hurt and you don't even know them, you don't, you know, you've never met them before, should you, should you help them? Okay, yes. And that's because Jesus calls us to help even people we don't know, just like we bring food for in Pakistan that we heard about this morning. So we're to help all kinds of people. This morning, you're going to hear a little bit about the Good Samaritan. Do you know the story of the Good Samaritan? Did you, have you heard that one? You may have. Somebody was passing by, a Samaritan was passing by, and there in the ditch was a person who had been robbed and beaten, and the Samaritan chose to help. He didn't know him. It wasn't his next-door neighbor. It wasn't even a person in his class. It was somebody he didn't even know, but he helped. He helped, and that's what what the kind of love, love your neighbor as yourself, means. So you're going to hear about that this morning. Okay, let's... Pray before you go to Sunday school. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us to love all of your children, everyone, because you love your children too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You can go to Sunday school, and the fourth through sixth graders are going to stay upstairs. So keep that in mind. Thank you, guys. Don't forget to go get Valentine's. And our praise team again invites you to be in a posture of worship as we praise our Lord this morning. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. 
never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Grace in his eyes, 
as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasures you found Thank you Janelle and Shannon and Deb and Garrett and Jim and Terry and Don, I want you to sing a song with me that you know Jesus loves me. I feel some of us need to be reminded of that today. Will you sing with me? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Faithful and loving God, we thank you that you love us. Your love is so unconditional, and it's so life-giving, and it is so forgiving. You're the God of the second chance and of the 99th chance. The God is always faithful, and you're always true. And in your love, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to show us the way, the most excellent way to live in this life and to be taken into eternity with you. So, Father, today I pray for those. I pray for those in that have gathered here in worship that need to sense and know the power of your love over their lives and for their peace and for their strength and for their healing and for their hope and for their discernment. Father, will you just speak? Speak clearly to our hearts. Speak, speak clearly to our minds. And Father, we, we sit and we listen. As your spirit moves among us and within us and through us. Hearing that you are a God who sings over us. That you are a God who loves us. Father, thank you. Thank you for all that you are and for all that we're becoming in you. Through the life-giving name of your Son, we pray. And together we say, Amen. As we gather here, we're going to spend some time praying for an, an intercessory prayer for others. And so I want to share with you those persons that we are aware of right now that um, are in times of rehabilitation or hospital or need. And there may be others that we're unaware of. And if you would like to share with us a prayer request in that little um, attendance pad that I ask you to sign in. There are prayer cards. You can, you can share your prayer concerns with us in that way. Or you, there are prayer cards back on the desk in the back here of Becker Hall or, or in the narthex. There's a box with prayer requests and you cards, and you can fill that as well. In your bulletin, you have a slim insert that shares with you prayer concerns that we, and I'm going to update it for you in some ways because things change from, from when this is printed on Thursday or Friday till today. But also at the end of the service, you can have a more exhaustive prayer list of prayer concerns for persons that's found in, in the back here of Becker Hall or in the North X. It's there on the wall, and there's um, a place for those prayer concerns. But let me let you know that we have a carnation on the altar. We've been having a lot of those lately. A lot of people are graduating to heaven. And so I want to tell you the sweet story about Lois Wakefield. Lois Wakefield is one of our older members of our congregation. She's been faithful in the prayer, prayer shawl ministry. May, maybe some of you have prayer shawls that she knitted, and, and you've been wrapped in her prayers. Well, she's had a battle off and on for a couple of years of health, and she'll rebound. She'll, she'll kind of slide back, and she recently had pneumonia. was in the hospital, and she's been in Ashley Rehab. And she went to sleep on Friday night, and, and by Saturday morning she woke up in heaven. She passed away at 5 a.m., yesterday morning without a struggle and very unexpectedly and so we ask that you would remember her family in your prayer she has two daughters and and her grandchildren and all there her service is going to be in Tarco, Missouri which is 
located, I think, in Atchison County. Is that what I, is that? It's in the middle of the state. It's a small town of about 1,000 people. That's where her husband is buried, and it'll be a graveside service. And those details are pending. They're meeting with the funeral home today. So we ask that you remember Lois Wakefield's family at this time. And then I want to let you know what is happening in the hospitals. Our little girl, Emery, the little three-year-old girl, this week she um, was ill, so she was at Mercy Hospital, and she had to um, be taken to Arkansas Children's Hospital. She also has pneumonia, so we're praying for her health and her recovery. And then Arlene Alford um, is another one that we claim is a miracle in our church. And Arlene had bronchitis and, you know, all that kind of stuff that comes with that. She was in the hospital at Mercy. She was released on Friday, and she's at home in recovery. She is married to the man that some of you know as the candy man, Rod Offered. And then um, we want to lift up Carol Boyd. Carol had knee replacement surgery this week, and um, she's at home. Last week, Yesterday, there were pictures of her out walking on the pavement. And so we pray for her and her recovery from knee replacement surgery. Jim Smith, who... Uh, worships in this service I'm looking he and they're not here today he was in the hospital this past week and so we want to lift him up in prayer he was released on Wednesday and then Darlene O'Brien will have some procedures this coming week we ask that you remember her there was a man that passed away not too long ago in our church family his name around Thanksgiving his name is Bob McBride Bob rode a bicycle well into his 90s and um Ultimately, his body just wore out, and his wife, Helen, has presented a gift in his memory and in his honor for his 96th birthday to the prayer shawl ministry, and so we're so grateful and thankful for, for that gift. As you know, we pray for our church in the Bella Vista community every week, and this week we have the privilege and the honor of praying for the Bella Vista Church of the Nazarene. It's just located right up the street from us. Um, um, and so we ask that uh, you remember that church and your prayers, especially as you drive past the church, um, that you would remember that church in prayer, the pastor, the congregation, their mission and their ministries, and, and for how God is using that church to reach out and touch people's lives and with the power of the gospel. But also, we also encourage you to pray for us as well. We've been encouraging you to pray for, for revival, spiritual revival in your personal lives and the life of this church, and I hope you're doing that. That's um, encouragement or challenge was to pray for five minutes a day, gather in groups of five and pray fast five times a week. That doesn't mean you have to fast all day for five days. Some people have, have wondered about that. Um, you, you can't. I mean, you know, you can do whatever you want to, but you're encouraged to, you know, Fast five times a week and spend time in prayer, whatever you like. And that's for your own personal lives, for your own spiritual revival, for the revival in our church, for the revival that take place in churches. Because we believe God is up to something good and always up to something good, and he's doing something continually fresh and new for us. I invite you now to go with me before the Lord, Son of Grace, in prayer. Faithful and loving God, it is a privilege and an honor to gather here with our brothers and sisters and our Lord to hear you speak your words of love over us. You are a God of sufficiency and of incredible grace. You are the Lord of mercy. And faithful God, you are with us at all times. And, but there's times that we seem to be unaware of it. And suddenly... We run face to face into you. You overwhelm us with a fresh measure of your love. You impact us and infuse us with fresh revelations of your mercy. Faithful God, we gather here today. We've come from busy lives. We've come from work lives. We've come from education lives and school lives. We've come from retirement lifestyles. We've come through active volatility and ministry and some of us come here with hurts and some of us come here with victories some of us come here seeking you for discernment and others come asking you father questions that we will never have answered in this life but together we come we come as your children 
which come as those that are dependent upon you. We're not independent from you. But faithful, loving God, we're dependent upon you. And you're our God who is active and you work. You're our God who's present. You're our God who heals our hearts and our hurts. And you provide hope. And so as we gather before your throne of mercy, we thank you, loving God, that your mercy is extended to every one of your children. And today we claim your word. That you are a God of promise. That you are a God who is faithful. That you are a God who has called us into fellowship with you. And you declare that you are a God who is faithful. We ask you, faithful God, to be with the persons who we've named today. In their times of recovery, their times of need, their times of healing. We celebrate the life of Bob McBride as he has gone home with you. We thank you for his wife, Helen. And faithful, loving God, we pray for Lois Wakefield's family. What an incredible gift for her to go to sleep on earth, but to wake up in heaven. Father, we thank you so much for all that she's offered in ministry in your name and for your faith that is proclaimed in her heart, in her life, and in her family. Father, we thank you so much for the ministry of the churches of Bella Vista. Especially today, we pray for Bella Vista Church of the Nazarene. (coughs) Father, we pray for the pastors. And we pray for the church leaders. We pray for the congregation. For the mission and ministry of the church. Cannot travel through Bella Vista without passing the the Nazarene Church. So we thank you that it has been placed as a beacon of hope and light in this community. Father, be with Pastor Judy. She brings your message and, and speaks to us from the realities of her heart. Father, clothe her with your grace and give her strength that she needs and help her in every life giving way. We thank you, Father, for all that you are and for all that you're doing. And Father, for those of us that are weak, we thank you that you are offering us strength. It's in the life-giving name of your Son, our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. And together we say, Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward, and I invite you to participate in the offering as you feel led. Some of you give on a a monthly basis, so you give your tithes and offerings, but you are so invited to place an offering of in the plate of whatever, just as an act of your worship today. Thank you so much. I heard I, heard I was blasted last week, so I thought I would... Uh, Find a song. I haven't sang this song in probably 13 years or 14. It was from the 90s, and so I thought I'd try it out today for Jamie. In the darkness everything is unknown i face the power of sin on my own i didn't know of a place where i could go where i could find a place to heal my wounded soul And he said that I could come into his presence without fear Into the holy place where his mercy hovers near I'm running, I'm running, I'm running to the mercy seat Where Jesus is calling, he said his grace would cover me His blood will 
flow freely it will provide the healing i'm running to the mercy seat i'm running to the mercy seat are you living where hope has not been lost in a curse of a lifetime of sin lovely illusions they never will come true but i know a place where there's mercy for you And he said that you could come into his presence without fear Into the holy place where his mercy hovers me Come running, come running, come running to the mercy seat where Jesus is calling He said his grace would cover me, his blood will no feeling it will provide the healing i'm running to the mercy seat i'm running to the mercy seat and he said that you could come into his presence without fear into the holy place where his mercy hovers me come running come running come running to the mercy seat where jesus is calling he said his grace will cover me his blood will flow freely it will provide the healing I'm running to the mercy seat. I'm running to the mercy. Come running, come running, come running to the mercy seat where Jesus is calling. He said his grace would cover me, his blood will flow freely. It will provide the healing. I'm running to the mercy seat. I'm running to the mercy seat. I'm running to the mercy Thank you, Garrett. I don't know about anybody else, but I needed to hear that this morning. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning. Instead of just reading the scripture to you, we're going to share it responsibly. I think. Yeah, we are. <laughs> this is from Psalm 119, 41 through 48. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your ordinances. And I shall walk at liberty, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before the rulers, and shall not be put to shame. For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I revere your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. The word of God for the people of God. I sure hope this sermon makes you all a lot more excited about the scripture than we sounded just now. <laughs> we all pray with me. 
Holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, in preparing for this sermon this morning, I have to be honest with you guys. I encountered the amazing challenge of which direction to go with the scripture and the topic of obedience. First, I considered on, about preaching on Torah piety because the whole of Psalm 119 is about um, engaging with the scriptures, with God's holy word. It stresses the importance of reading, studying, knowing, loving, and longing for God's laws and precepts. Of course, if I did that, that would naturally lead us into a discussion about the study of Scripture as a means of grace, according to our Wesleyan tradition. Y'all follow that? Of course. And John Wesley encouraged the people that are called Methodists to regularly read and study Scripture, as well as to pray and to fast, to attend worship, and to share our faith with others as acts of piety which mature us in our Christian faith. But that didn't really seem like the direction the sermon needed to go this morning. So next, I considered preaching about the history of Psalm 119 and the importance of God's commands and instructions to the Hebrew people and to us. You know, most scholars understand that this particular psalm was probably written in the 4th or 5th century before Christ, much later than most of the other psalms. At that time, the Hebrew people were returning from Babylon, where they had been sent in exile because they had been disobedient to God and God's statutes. As they returned to their homeland, they encountered a rough theological crisis. Everything that they held sacred that helped them understand who God was and who they were as followers of God had either been taken or destroyed. The temple, when they return, is in ruins. The Davidic monarchy that God had promised that David's descendants would remain on the throne is no more. And even the promised land, the promised land is inhabited by foreigners. The psalmist in 119 is reminding the people to rely on God's love and God's statutes and God's promises of who God is and who they are as God's people. I even thought about drawing the correlation between the Hebrews' need for a fresh, new understanding of God and our own prayers for spiritual revival as we seek for us and for our church and for our denomination a new and fresh understanding of where God is leading us. But the historical connection didn't quite seem to be the way to go this morning. Of course, the lawyer in me surfaced. You knew it would, right, with the word obedience. And I thought about obedience from the perspective of obeying the laws of the land out of fear of the consequences. Fines, tickets, jail, death. But that didn't seem to be the intention of the psalmist either. And then I read the passage again. I'm going to invite you to pull out your bulletins and look at the passage. That might help as we, as we uh, move forward. I read the passage again, and I approached the Scripture this time expecting, anticipating, having an encounter with the living Word of God. As I read the first verse, I stopped on the word love. Verse 41 begins with, Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. And then there it was again in the last two verses. 
For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I revere your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. It hit me. The psalmist call, call to obedience is rooted in love. God's love for the psalmist in verse 41 and the psalmist's love for God in verses 47 and 48. It's clear. The psalmist is absolutely in love with God and with God's instruction. It's a reciprocal kind of love. The psalmist's obedience comes from listening to God and God's commandments, precepts, rules, truth, and wisdom. The psalmist's love reflects his or her desire to know God better, to please the one who is love, to become more like God, to draw closer and closer to God. What a beautiful image of being in love with God as we approach the day of love, Valentine's Day. For the psalmist and for us, obedience is love, and love is obedience. There's another scripture passage that I want to share with you this morning. It's from John 14, verse 21, that reminds us of Jesus' instructions about love and obedience. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I, too, will love them and show myself to them. Did you know that word obedience, that kind of, does anybody else feel awful when they hear that word obey or obedience? I don't know, there's something that just, I don't know how it strikes me, but it's like, really? But did you know that word that can bring up such awful connotations for us and feelings actually means to hear? or to listen. At the time that this psalm was written and when the other psalms were created, the Hebrew people didn't have Bibles. They didn't pick up their iPad. They didn't pick up their, their Bible and start reading along with the, the pastor, or the priest, I should say. Instead, they had scrolls that held God's word. And those scrolls were held in the temples. So for the most part, unless they went into Jerusalem, they didn't even see a scroll. So for them, they heard God's word and they meditated on it because that's how they carried it with them. So to obey God's statutes, as our scripture tells us this morning, was literally at that time to hear them. But have you ever thought about the fact that how we listen makes a difference? It makes a huge difference as to what we receive. One of my former seminary professors and friends, Carla Kincannon, describes listening as an act of holy obedience in her book, Creativity and Divine Surprise. Hear these words from her about listening. Listening for the voice of the Spirit, for the inner voice, involves an act of holy obedience. Listening well goes beyond intellectual activity. Wholehearted listening requires bringing our whole self, body, mind, heart, and spirit into the act of listening. 
The ancient Hebrews understood the heart to be the center of the entire person, the nucleus of emotion, will, and intellect. Wholehearted listening invites deep listening. Not the selective kind of listening a parent uses with a babbling three-year-old child or grandchild. It requires, get this, listen to this, it requires the suspension of premature judgments, allowing the listener to receive new information and embrace new possibilities. Wholehearted listening teaches us to pay attention to all facets of life with the expectation, did you hear that word? Expectation that God can come to us in the most unlikely of ways. Because if we are deaf to God, if we are deaf to God, our journey to the place of resurrection never begins. We have been praying for revival. And I hope that you too have been in your daily prayer time praying for revival. But we cannot be obedient if we cannot be obedient through listening. How is God going to revive us? You know, when you, when you pray for revival, I don't know if you think of, if you really thought this through, but when we pray for revival, we're praying for God to do something different in our lives. We're praying for the Holy Spirit to come in and have its way with us. We're praying for a new vision and a new understanding of God's holy work, not only in our lives, but in this church and in our community, in our denomination, and in the world. Folks, praying for revival is risky business. We don't know what's going to happen. Are you ready for that? Are you expecting when you pray to hear God speak into your life? To motivate you, to guide you in a new direction? To glorify God? our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I was talking to somebody last night, and we were talking about how God speaks to us. And certainly God does speak to us through Scripture, especially when we come to Scripture expecting God to transform us. But God also speaks to us in nudges and thoughts. We're sharing about, both of us were sharing about how at times in our lives, we had just instantaneously had a thought come to us. We'd been praying about something, and we'd had a thought come to us, and we'd said, that was not me. That must have been the Holy Spirit. And those things happen in our lives. But folks, we're praying for that to happen in our church. And you know what? It could get a little uncomfortable. Praying for revival, praying for a new vision, praying for a new spirit to wake us up and move us might require us to get out of our familiar seats or from our familiar tables, might require us to get up and get out of the church and go talk to people about what Jesus Christ is doing in our lives so that we can share God's love. Revival, though, praying for revival, doesn't just stop with, Lord, renew us. It requires the obedience of holy listening. It requires praying to God and then being quiet and listening for what the Holy Spirit is telling us. And then then it requires us to go talk with other Christian fellows to discern where God is leading us. Obedience and deep listening are hard work. 
There's no doubt about it. And building deep and intimate relationships with God and our neighbors is hard work. So I'm going to challenge you guys to something. You ready? Are you all ready? All right. Here's your challenge. This week, when you're praying for revival, as I know you all are, and if you have it, then you can start this week. I'm going to invite you, challenge you to take some time in silence before God. Take some time to listen to what God has for you. Go into your prayer time expecting God to speak to you, to nudge you, to guide you through God's holy word, through inspirational thoughts, even in conversations with friends. But make that time to listen so that you can, you too, like the psalmist, can hear God's wisdom and truth spoken into your lives. Will you pray with me? Holy, loving, and life-giving God, we're going to admit here that, you know, praying for spiritual revival is a little anxiety-producing because we don't know what you're going to do. And we know that if from the depths of our hearts we truly pray for revival and we expect you to act and to speak into our lives and into our church and into our denomination, we may, we will lose control. But God, we so desperately want a new and fresh spirit within our lives, within our church, within our denomination. That we ask for your strength and we ask for your courage to pray for revival and to listen for where your spirit is leading us. And grant us the vision to follow you, whatever it takes and wherever you lead. For it's in Christ's holy and precious name we pray. And together we say, Amen. As the praise band comes forward, <laughs> um, I want to invite you, if you do not have a church home and you desire to become a member of this church this day, we, are, we would welcome you with open arms. Uh, you can either transfer your membership um, from another denomination or you can become a member of this church by profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if during the singing of our final song you would care to be in a time of prayer, the altars, are, the kneeling rails are, are open and welcome you. So let us now sing with gusto to God in our hearts.
And so go now into the world, remembering to take a time of silence to listen for God's word of revival. And remember that love is obedience, and obedience is love. And that we're not just called to come to church, but who are we called to be? be All right, go in peace. <laughs>